none. And the reason for that is we can study chromosome fusions, which occur all the time, in laboratory mice, in fruit flies, in Drosophila, and other organisms. And for the most part, the fusing of two chromosomes together doesn't have a very profound genetic effect. So the fusing of primate chromosomes 12 and 13 to produce human chromosome number two probably had very little to do with what makes us human. In other words, when you actually line up the primate chromosomes 12 and 13 with ours, you find that most of the genes match. Um, and the fusion site really has very little influence on gene expression. So uh, very often when I talk about that, um, someone will get up in the audience and challenge. It's not what you did. But someone will get up in the audience and challenge and say, how could the fusion of two chromosomes change a chimpanzee into a human being? And the answer is, it can't. Um, but this is simply a, a fortuitous, a lucky genetic rearrangement that occurred in the line that led to us that enables us to look at our own DNA and see where it came from. And in this case, we clearly came from an organism in which those two parts of chromosome number two were separate, and we can look around and we see where those organisms are. They're the great apes. So um, I want to thank you for your questions. I'll take some more, um, take some more at, the, at the end. Um, and now what I'd like to do is tell you a little bit about that trial. Um, the trial involved events that took place in Dover, Pennsylvania. Dover is a small town. Um, this is a high school that graduates about 150 kids a year. There are four high school teachers in Dover, that's all. And the reason I put the cover of my textbook up there was because in 2004, the teachers at Dover High decided that they wanted to buy new biology textbooks for their students. That's the book they picked. They then had to have this approved by the local school board. This is not the state of Pennsylvania. This is just the town of Dover. And a number of uh, school board members didn't like the book. One of them was named William Buckingham, and he said what he didn't like about this book was that from beginning to end, this book is laced with Darwinism. Um, you know how authors try to sell books by putting little quotes on the back jacket to tell you how good they are? Well, Joe Levine and I, my co-author, we're thinking about putting this on the back jacket of that book because we think... <laughs> Under certain circumstances, it might help us to sell books. But Mr. Buckingham and other board members persuaded the board to instruct the teachers in Dover to start preparing intelligent design lessons in schools. Um, as this case moved along, an awful lot of people said, wait a minute, this isn't a scientific issue the board is pushing. This is a religious issue. And as I mentioned, a trial took place uh, about a year ago. A whole series of expert witnesses showed up in that trial. Um, and I had the honor, if you want to call it that, of being sort of the first expert witness in the trial. Um, it started a year ago yesterday. I figured that I would uh, testify on Monday, get cross-examined, fly back to Providence, and give the lecture, which I always do Tuesday at 1 o'clock in my cell biology course. I had no problem. But my cross-examination went on and on and on, and I had to be on the stand for two days. So I emailed this article from Science Magazine to all the students in the class so they'd understand um, the reason I had to cancel Tuesday's lecture wasn't because I was on a ski trip or vacation, but I was actually tied up in court and they thought that was okay. I emailed them the link to the report about my testimony in the New York Times. They thought that was okay. But I have to tell you, they were not really impressed until they saw that the trial was being reported in what is, for you, I'm sure, and for today's college students, the ultimate news source. And that turned out to be <laughs> The Daily Show. And as soon as they saw that John Stewart was reporting on the trial, they decided, that's cool, this is important, it's okay for the professor to be there. <laughs> the trial lasted more than seven weeks. As one person pointed out, in fact, it was the judge who pointed this out, the trial lasted 40 days. Think about that. And that's how. And then the judge had to render his decision. And the decision, which came out in December of last year, was a stinging rebuke of intelligent design. It simply slapped down the Board of Education. It was an extraordinary decision. Um, and it's well worth reading. The case is actually called Kitz Miller, K-I-T-Z Miller. That was the name of the lead pl plaintiff, Tammy Kitz Miller, K-I-T-Z Miller, Kitz Miller v. Dover. You can find it on Google very easily. The decision is extremely easy to read. And this judge, who incidentally is a Republican conservative judge, appointed by President George W. Bush and praised during his confirmation hearings as a strict constructionist, which he is. This judge wrote an exceptional opinion. Now, what happened in the trial uh, was remarkably interesting. And there were many cartoons. You can't take pictures in federal court. This is the New Yorker's caricature of a fellow named Michael Behe who testified in, in defense of the school board being cross-examined. 
This is a MSNBC sketch of me in the courtroom being cross-examined uh, in front of the judge by the lawyers to the other side. And the key in the trial was making the case for evolution. And I wanted to uh, have a few things to say about exactly how we did that. Now, I've talked about this thing called intelligent design, which was the theory that was presented as an alternative to evolution. So what is intelligent design? Religious people of all stripes um, believe that there really is an intelligent design to the universe, which is the work of the creator. And for what it's worth, that's what I happen to believe myself. But this is actually, in this context, not what is meant by intelligent design. Intelligent design, in terms of this argument, means something else. And it is the claim that design, and what is meant by design here is outside supernatural puff of smoke intervention, is required to account for the origins of living things. That means that intelligent design, or ID as I will call it, is actually a doctrine of special creation. Species appear because a creator makes them. And in this respect, it's really nothing more, uh, nothing newer than good old-fashioned creationism sort of spiffed up to make it sound scientific and to appear non-religious. So I want to tell you how people go about arguing for this. One of their principal claims is that evolution cannot explain the origin of complex biochemical machines. That's a bacteria. And the little whips you see coming out of one end are called flagella. A lot of bacteria, including E. coli, in your stomach right now, have little flagella. These flagella are enormously complex, and they spin around like crazy to propel this bacterium through liquids of all sorts, including ones inside your body. Now, the argument is that these flagella, which at a molecular level are really quite complex and quite beautiful, possess something called irreducible complexity. And that means that even in principle, they just couldn't have been produced by evolution. That's the argument. So if evolution couldn't have produced them, they must have been designed or they must have been produced in a puff of smoke creation. And Michael Behe, who did testify in the trial for the school board, says you can't produce irreducibly complex systems by modifying a previous system, that's how evolution would do it, because any precursor to one of these complex systems that is missing a part is by definition non-functional. If the flagellum has 30 proteins and you're missing two or three or four, it doesn't work. And therefore, evolution could not gradually have produced 10 parts, 15, 20 parts, knowing that a couple million years in the future these parts would be useful. They've got to be useful right now. That's true, by the way. And therefore, it couldn't have produced this flagellum. That's the argument. Now, in case people don't get this flagellum, um, Dr. Behe likes to make an analogy to a mousetrap. And some of you may have noticed, I brought, so I'm sure that all of you lead such vermin-free lives that you've probably never seen a mousetrap. But I brought one along with me. And a mousetrap has five parts. It's got a base plate, bait holder, a little hammer, a spring, and then a catch. And it's true that if you take any of these parts away, the mousetrap seemingly will not work. So all these parts have to be together at the same time in order to have function. And as Dr. Behe has written, all the components have to be in place before you can catch any mice. Therefore, it's irreducibly complex, just like the bacterial flagellum. Now, putting it in a more graphic way, the machine itself, whether it's a flagellum, whether it's a mousetrap, or whether it's some other combination of proteins, has a function. And that function can be favored by natural selection. But the individual parts, he argues, don't have any function until you put them all together. Because of that, they couldn't have evolved. And what he has written is since natural selection requires a function to select, no argument there, it's true, an irreducibly complex biochemical system would have to arise all at once for natural selection. That, as you'll see, is not true. But that's the argument for all of this. So putting it, again, graphically, if you have a complex machine, it has a function that can be favored by natural selection. But the individual parts have no function. Therefore, they cannot be shaped by natural selection. Therefore, this machine couldn't have evolved. Therefore, proof of the designer. Well, that's pretty powerful. How does evolution explain that? Well, the way that evolution explained it, and Darwin actually explained it as well, is that's a false view. These complex machines actually arise from simpler machines with limited numbers of parts, and the components themselves originate with different functions. As these parts get put together, new functions emerge, and the final function uh, emerges only when you put the parts together. So natural selection can work on these all the way through. 
Now that's not evidence, that's just an argument.